Whether new shooter, longtime gun owner, or even police officer or soldier, your handgun needs a Crimson Trace laser sight or light. Get the confidence and reliability you need to protect family, home, and country. Crimson Trace. Today on Gun Talk, it's been 20 years since the passage of the Brady Act. Gun control groups proclaim it to be a great success, but what's the real story? And another failure of a gun-free zone. A military base where soldiers are prevented from protecting themselves. 19 shot, 3 dead. How much longer will we put up with this callous loss of life to support a gun ban agenda? Jeff Knox and John Lott join Tom, and so can you. Just call 1-866-TALK-GUN. Now, here's Tom. Oh, yeah, some week, huh? Wow. A lot of discussions going on. I'm glad that you can be a part of it. Hey, I'm Tom Gresham. This is Gun Talk. Check it out, guntalk.com. If you want a chance to win uh, our giveaway this month, just go to guntalk.com slash win. If you'd like to, uh, it's W-I-N. If you'd uh, like to pick up some of our DVDs, instructional DVDs on concealed carry and some of our books, just go to shopguntalk.com. You can check that out. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, first of all, let me give you the, uh, the, the news. You know some of the news, but the one you may not have heard of is this week, Otis McDonald died. If you don't know his name, you probably have heard of what he accomplished among others. A number of other things. But Otis McDonald will forever be known as the man whose name was synonymous with the Second Amendment case that came out of the Supreme Court, the McDonnell case. And in that, it was a victory over Chicago's handgun ban. Chicago completely banned handguns. The Supreme Court said, nope, that is a violation of the Second Amendment. And furthermore, the Supreme Court said that the right to keep keep and bear arms is incorporated to the states via the 14th Amendment. Huge, huge decision. So you combine the Heller decision and the McDonald decision, and we get what we have today where the right to keep and bear arms, the Second Amendment, is understood to be a fundamental right. So I was privileged to have met and actually sat next to Mr. McDonald at the Gun Rights Policy Conference so two or three years ago. Uh, a real pioneer, a, a kind gentleman and we are all uh, better off for him having been around and we uh, just want to say thank you uh, the news that Otis McDonald has died all right you of course been following the news you've seen the stories coming out of Fort Hood Texas another shooting on a military base another shooting at a gun free zone 19 people shot three dead And what's interesting about this one, there is a change to some extent, not completely, but to some extent in the conversation. In the coverage of it, we actually have people on a national level saying, wow, perhaps, just perhaps, they're not going to go so far as to actually say we should, but perhaps we should at least look at the idea of removing the prohibitions for people to have guns for self-protection on military bases. And of course they say, well, gee, you you would trust the military, of course, not understanding that there are 9 million, maybe 10 million people now who have carry permits around the country. Well, somebody who wrote a a really great piece on this and has written a number of great books, including uh, More Guns, Less Crime, and a number of other books, you know, John Lott is joining us right now. Hey, John, how are you? Great great to talk to you, Tom. And and I want to say uh, I also knew... uh, Otis a little bit. I also met his, uh, his son, mm-hmm. and uh, Otis was an extremely kind man, uh, and uh, I also enjoyed talking to his son. They're both uh, real, you know, good people, and uh, it's yep. just too bad that uh, he's passed. I, I'm, I'm reading this report. Uh, Alan Gottlieb said when they're walking down the stairs from the Supreme Court from their victory, uh, said Otis told him, said he promised his mother that one day he would make her proud. Well, he made us all proud. Right. <laughs> now, do I understand this right? Is your son at Fort Hood? Yeah, my son is at Fort Hood. Uh, he's a sergeant in the Army. Uh, he's uh, in intelligence. 
and uh, he just got back from um, a tour of duty in Afghanistan in mid-January. But he was he was about two blocks, a little bit less, I guess, than two blocks away from uh, the attack when it started, uh, and he could hear the shots. Um, so, uh, you know, the irony is, I mean, you, you were mentioning these issues of gun-free zones. The irony right. is, is that while uh, he was stationed in Afghanistan, they were required to keep their firearms with them. Um, and the reason was pretty simple, and that was you have Afghanis working on the base, and there have been uh, several cases where uh, Afghanis have turned on Americans and mm -hmm. tried to kill them. And, uh, and so, uh, you know, it's understood that seconds can matter in those types of instances uh, to stop an attack from occurring. Right. And so they want to make sure that all the soldiers have their weapons with them in order to uh, to be able to respond. And because because you know, they can be attacked at any time. That was the whole point of it. That's right. Yeah, and okay. uh, and I assume they believe that if they weren't armed, uh, the attacks would actually be more frequent. That they would feel that they, uh, you know, had an advantage. And the problem is uh, when the troops are back in the United States. Since 1993, there's been a general ban on them being able to go and have their weapons with them. And, uh, you know, the, the killer in this case depended upon that. He knew that uh, the people that he would be attacking would be following the rules, would be following the orders that were there, and would be defenseless, wouldn't be able to go and defend themselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, he took advantage of that. Now, one of the things that's different this time, and not everybody, and I see what Media Matters has done, and it's you know, some crazy stuff there, but there has been a lot more talk on CBS, ABC, CNN, even CNN, of, well, maybe, you know, maybe we should allow these people to have guns. Maybe, and I guess my question for you, John, because you've covered this for a long time, are people starting to at least get the glimmer, maybe not the whole idea, but the glimmer of an idea that maybe you can't really prevent it, but perhaps you can stop it somewhere before the police arrive? You know, it's something I was actually shocked. There were a few uh, news reporters that would call me up on Thursday and Friday this last week who would ask, well, uh, should we try to get rid of these gun-free zones? And I have to say, I was fairly stunned because <laughs> usually before, uh, or always before, if I got asked anything related, it would be like, well, what gun control laws should we have in order to try to stop this? And I would have to interject into the conversation, well, let's get rid of these <clears throat> gun-free zones. Uh, and so the fact that reporters were actually bringing this up was uh, pretty shocking. And, um, you know, in 1998, I wrote an op-ed for the Wall Street Journal about gun-free zones. I think, uh, and the thing is, everybody attacked me on that. Right. I mean, it was everybody on kind of both sides of the debate just about. It. I mean, there were some conservative radio talk show hosts that uh, supported me. But even, you know, it's hard to think of... <clears throat> any organized group, because it was just, there had been a shooting at a school in Arkansas uh, immediately prior to me writing the piece for the journal. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the notion of gun-free zones in schools was just a bridge too far, I think, for people. Right. And no, uh, Not for me, but, of you course. Know, <laughs> what, not you. No, I'm not saying you. I'm yeah. just, uh, but I'm saying... Um, even even a number of conservative talk show hosts. I mean, it was just too far of a bridge. Right. And, but now, uh, and and there weren't any organized groups that I know of that came out uh, in favor of what I was saying. And um, but now, I'm not saying we have uh, a majority of the people that understand that, but it's substantial, and you see this happening all the time. And there's like eight states or nine states, depending on how you measure it, that have move to get rid of gun-free zones on uh, universities and college campuses, mm -hmm. people realize that despite the best of intentions, uh, these types of bans just make it easier for the killers to go and do the attacks rather than uh, make it safer for the victims. Well, you know, and, I think uh, what's happened is I, I think what uh, people are now looking at, it, and after there have been several of these shootings, they, they actually are looking at the timelines and 
they're saying, wait a minute, you mean it took five minutes? You mean it took 10 minutes? You mean it took 15 minutes or right. more for the police to show up? And we know that the bad guy is going to keep shooting people until somebody with a gun exactly. shows up. Now, the, the, the person who shows up with a gun may shoot him or the bad guy may shoot himself. But that is the precipitant event that ends the whole attack is when somebody with a gun shows up. I mean, do uh, you agree? I, could, I, well, I couldn't believe, agree more. Look, uh, in the late 90s, uh, anybody who's read my books know this, but um, in the late 90s work that I did with Bill Landis, we looked at all the multiple victim public shootings in the United States from, uh, uh, from like, uh, 1977 through 1999, and what we found was that um, uh, one thing that explained uh, the number of people killed or injured in these attacks was exactly what you were saying, that the longer the amount of time between when the attack starts and when somebody's able to arrive on the scene with the gun, the more carnage that you're going to have. And that, uh, you know, when you, a state passed a concealed carry law, you'd see a drop in these uh, mass shootings and a drop in the number of people killed mm-hmm. or injured. And that to the extent to which these attacks would still occur, they overwhelmingly occur in those tiny areas within the state in which uh, permanent concealed handguns weren't allowed. So, you know, it's um, you look it, since at least 1950, um, mm-hmm. and with just two exceptions, all the mass public shootings in the United States have taken place where guns are banned. It just can't be by accident at some point <laughs> that you're looking right. at that. I mean, you live in a right-to-carry state. Uh, I'm in Pennsylvania right now at the moment, and there, you, if you live in Pennsylvania, you have a concealed carry permit, there, you can carry your gun virtually any place in the state. Uh, there are literally just a few places where you're banned from being able to carry the gun. And, uh, and if these attacks were random, then 99% of the attacks would take place in areas where guns were allowed. But instead, they occur in the tiny area where they're banned and exactly and, and you know and we know that you have to have a first responder show up and my whole argument is we that first responder does not have to be wearing a uniform this first responder can be a teacher or a parent or anybody else who happens to be there because when that person shows up with a gun you have the end of the attack right no, exactly right. I mean, uh, you know, about 75% of the time that these attacks occur, uh, the killers themselves die at the scene, uh, and it's either because they commit suicide or somebody shoots them. And, and even in the 25% where they stay alive, they planned on dying, but just couldn't bring themselves to commit suicide at the last moment. Right, exactly. Hey, John, tell people about uh, Crime Prevention Research Center, where they can get more information on what you've been up to. Yeah, well, you can find everything we were just talking about at crimepreventionresearchcenter.org. That's crimepreventionresearchcenter.org. And, uh, you know, it's set up precisely to go and deal with these types of topics and give people facts. You know, so if they go to crimepreventionresearchcenter.org. That'll work. And it's, you get all sorts of intellectual ammunition you can use there. And also, if I would ask you, if you will, throw a, a few dollars in the kitty when you go over there because the donations help John do exactly what he's doing here is spread this information. John, you do wonderful work. It is always a pleasure to have you here. Great talking to you, Tom. Thank you. All right. You take care. John Lott, of course, noted author, researcher, and uh, now this great... Uh, Actually, it's a, a wonderful thing he started. The Crime Prevention Research Center. Again, crimepreventionresearchcenter.org. Lots of information there. If you want to be able to debate, to discuss it intelligently, you can go there and find out things. All right. What did you think when you heard about the Fort Hood shooting, the second one? Did you think, oh, no, not again? Or did you think, well, sure, it's another, it's the same old gun-free zone. 866-TALK-GUN. 866-TALK-GUN. Fort Hood. How did it hit you? Thinking about buying a modern sporting rifle? Well, now's the time with the Cold Spring Fever promotion. Right now, and for a limited time, when you buy any Colt modern sporting rifle, you get a free Colt rifle case from Bulldog. Visit your local gun dealer or go to Colt.com slash Spring Fever to get more info. Buy any Colt modern sporting rifle and get a free Colt rifle case from Bulldog. Go to Colt.com slash Spring Fever to get more information. 
The 45 Auto, also known as the 1911, is the standard other defensive pistols are measured against. No matter what pistol you carry, techniques developed around the 1911 are vital. You know you need training. And you know your concealed carry class definitely was not training. Now Gun Talk presents an exciting DVD, Fighting with the 1911 with Tiger McKee. Tiger's unique training style will have you drawing, moving, shooting, and running your gun better, no matter what style pistol you prefer. At ShopGunTalk.com, you can order our DVDs of Tiger's instruction. ShopGunTalk.com also has a two-DVD set, including Concealed Carry 1. Get both for the information you know you need. This really is life and death. ShopGunTalk.com has DVDs, books, and other essential gear. ShopGunTalk.com. That's ShopGunTalk.com. The Smith & Wesson Bodyguards carry more comfortably, walk more confidently. When it comes to personal protection, nothing beats a bodyguard. Choose the lightweight, compact, and concealable Bodyguard 380 pistol or the Bodyguard 38 revolver, both with a built-in laser sight. The Smith & Wesson Bodyguards carry more comfortably, walk more confidently. One machine, one operator. Each machine is run by a single pair of hands. Hands that spend all day, every day, learning the machine inside and out. We don't believe in quotas. The point is crafting faultless ammunition, no matter how long that takes. It's not quick or easy. Being the best never is. Black Hills Ammunition. It started with our hands. to win the 50 years of 1022 giveaway with Ruger. Grand prize includes the 50th anniversary design contest Ruger 1022 rifle, a 1022 50th anniversary case, t-shirt and decal, and a sling with magazine pouch. Each week, five first prize winners will receive a Ruger prize pack consisting of a tactical backpack, a 1022 50th anniversary t-shirt, and a set of 10 plastic stadium cups. Enter to win at guntalk.com slash giveaway. Good luck and and now, back to Tom. All right, 866-TALK-GUN. We'll get you here. I'll just dial one Tom Talk Gun. Deanna has done exactly that on three out of deep in the heart of Texas in Waco. Hey, Deanna, how are you? Oh, I'm doing fine this morning. I, I have a hard time understanding how the officials and those in charge don't stop and think. All of our member, military members, are proficient in weaponry, that's a part of their basic training. I come from a military background. Uh, my son is Army. This is something they have to be proficient at during basic training and to go out and offer their lives when they're overseas fighting in wars. Um, it's just asinine that these base commanders have shut down and made these gun-free zones. This is twice that probably lives could have been saved, injuries could have been prevented. It's just stupid to not allow these professional men and women to be armed. I could not agree with you more. I, I love your characterization. It's just stupid. It is. I, you, you've you nailed it right on the head. I, it's just, just dumb not to let... And for us to see this happen over and over, we had Fort Hood, we had the uh, Navy Yard shootings, and now Fort Hood again. Um, how long are they going to let this go on? We're, and I understand them wanting to say, well, gee, what could have st- prevented this? Was there something wrong with him? Was he mentally ill? You know what? I don't care. I don't care what motivated him. I don't care what you're going to do about mental health. Yeah, of course it's important. But here's what I care about. Don't let him shoot so many people. You can you can reduce the number. You can't prevent it unless you're going to put everybody through a metal detector, everybody who goes in. You can't prevent it, but you can reduce the number of people who get shot. And you do that by having someone on the scene, a first responder who doesn't have to call for help, somebody who is right there when it happens, Show up with a gun and end the problem. Thank you, Diane. I appreciate that. Ivan's on, two out of San Antonio, another Texan. Hey, Ivan. 
Hello, Tom. Hey, Tom, I have a question for you on the uh, mm -hmm. MMP shield. Um, uh, I am a Glock guy, and I've mm -hmm. shot the 40 caliber, the baby Glock in 40, and uh, it's mm -hmm. a little snappy. My question is, I shot the MMP shield in 40, and I was surprised mm -hmm. at the recoil. I was expecting, like, uh, a pretty hard kick, per se, but mm -hmm. it really wasn't. It was very manageable, and it took me by surprise. So my question to you is, have you shot the shield in 9 millimeter? And what's the difference in recoil between them both in that platform? Sure. Yeah, I've shot both of them. The uh, the 40 is a little snappy uh, compared to the 9. The 9 is a pussycat. I think what you've experienced is the difference between the grip design on the Glock and the shield. Uh, and it's just, it's amazing. You'll have essentially the same amount of force coming back. I mean, if you're shooting a 40 caliber with the same bullet, the only variable then becomes the weight of the gun as far as the pure, real, physical, physics recoil. But the felt recoil or the impression of recoil is a whole other thing, and that's how the gun fits your hand. The shield, I, in my hand, just fits me better uh, than the baby Glocks do. It's a little bit easier to hold on to. But I think what you would find is if you go from the 40 to the 9, it, the 9 is a pussycat. The 40 recoils more than a 45. I don't think people understand that. The 40 has more recoil than a 45 in all guns. So the, the way it really goes is 9, 45, and 40, with 40 having the most recoil, just by the nature of the velocity and the, uh, the impulse that it has. So you know, if you could get even a, uh, like the XDS, Springfield XDS comes in 45, that's going to kick less than a 40 is. So it's an interesting situation where the 40 was supposed to be some kind of a compromise but it's actually a little bit, well, sometimes a lot snappier than the 9 and the 45. So anyway, that, that's my thought. Uh, thinking about this, uh, the Fort Hood deal, you know, we have to have more first responders. First responders are people who stop it when it happens. The, uh, the general on the base there said, well, you know, the police got there just in a few minutes. Really? Is it okay if I just take a crowbar and start whacking on you and breaking bones? And start the stopwatch. Give me 120 seconds, two minutes, insanely great response time. No? Not good? How about if we had somebody that stopped it in the first five seconds? Better? Have you taken your family, friends, and kids shooting lately? You're listening to Tom Gresham's Gun Talk, and we'll be right back. Want to be a guest on the show? Drop us a line at info at guntalk.com. You're listening to Gun Talk with Tom Gresham. All right, 866-TALK-GUN. We'll get you in here. Just now, one Tom Talk Gun. That's the number here. If you'd like to shoot me an email, tom at guntalk.com. Don't forget that you can enter for a chance to win our giveaway. Go to guntalk.com slash win, W-I-N, and enter for a chance there. A lot of things going on. Our, uh, of course... The First Person Defender series continues to be strong. If you go to the uh, our YouTube channel, Gun Talk Media, we have a whole series of videos of stories of people being put in self-defense situations and see how they do. And then we train them some, and then we try it again, and they do better. A lot of learning experiences there. A lot of the, I never thought of that situations where people go, wow, it never occurred to me to do that, or I never realized that I could get attacked that way. Yes, I know. That's why we do these. You never thought of that. That's why we bring in these top trainers. We'll start shooting the uh, next season a first-person defender in a couple of months. So, by the way, if you want to uh, be interested in being involved in that, maybe being one of our good guys, uh, shoot us a note, info at guntalk.com, info at guntalk.com. We're talking about the Fort Hood shootings. One man on base shoots 19, kills three. Don't know why he did it. And you know, when I say I don't care, that's not really true. But for the purposes of this discussion, I'm not really concerned about that because that's a bigger issue of, uh, of everything else. And people say, well, how can we prevent it? You can't. Simply put, you can't prevent it. But you can take steps to lessen the damage. These 
Active murderers, active killers, stop when somebody with a gun shows up at Newtown, Navy Yard, Fort Hood, Fort Hood, on and on and on, Trolley Square. I mean, just name one of them. When somebody shows up with a gun, they shoot themselves or they give up or they get shot. So the goal then, would it not make sense? The goal would be to have somebody with a gun show up more quickly rather than waiting two minutes or five minutes or 10 minutes or 15 minutes, during which time, bang, somebody gets shot, another 10 seconds, bang, somebody gets shot, another 10 seconds, bang, somebody gets shot. Can we have somebody step in and stop this carnage? Oh, no, we have to call. We have to ask for the right people to come. We have to wait for the authorized people to come and stop this. How about if Susie or Betty or Jane or Bob or Tom or anybody pulls out a gun and puts a stop to it right now? D-R-T. Stop it. I mean, really, the question gets to be fairly simple, does it not? Do you want him to shoot people for 10 or 15 seconds? Or would you prefer him to shoot people for 5 or 10 minutes? And will you gin up the political courage to say, yes, we should remove the shackles. We should allow people to protect themselves and others because we know it works. We have almost 10 million people in this country now who have concealed carry permits And they commit crime at a rate roughly 1% of that of the general public. They commit crimes at a lower rate than police officers or judges or lawyers do. People with concealed carry permits. Why would you not want more of them? Why would you not want them carrying in more places where they can stop this? It's amazing to me. It is amazing to me. Line four, Chuck's with us out of Crosby, Texas. Hey, Chuck. Uh, Tom, you're absolutely right. When I was uh, going through BASIC in 1967, we carried our uh, M14s with us 24-7. We were constantly armed. Uh, The the thing that we're looking at, number one, uh, a a general today is like a chief of police. They're nothing but political pawns. Ever since Patsy Schroeder gutted the officer corps, all your officer, your general officers have to go through a filter in Congress, so you're not going to see a Patton or a Eisenhower or or MacArthur uh, these days. They're they're not allowed. So anything that comes out of the Pentagon is nothing more than lip service to the administration and to the lunatics in Congress. So don't pay any attention to what is is, uh, brandish as the official position. Number two, this kid was a truck driver. And I can tell you from the Gulf War, we literally beat those poor kids to death as truck drivers. You don't have to be in combat on the front lines to, to have PTSD and have problems. Mm-hmm. Actually, the target in modern warfare is the rear area, the medical, the logistical, the support tail, and especially in a guerrilla warfare environment, that's where they're going to try to inflict the most damage. So, you know, I don't doubt that what this kid, uh, you know, had uh, PTSD, which is a multifaceted thing. I've been working with this since Vietnam since the, you know, 20, 30 years now. And and normally it's a depression, it's more of a suicidal problem, but it will manifest itself uh, during high-stress environments uh, in lashing out and, and, you know, an explosive reaction from uh, constant hypervigilance. So, you know, I, I think probably what happened is, yeah, that there, there really was some element of, of PTSD involved in this. But here's the key to the whole thing. You know, this stupid up or out policy that we have, once you've got a, co- a company commander, a captain who actually learns what he's doing, and you've got a first sergeant who's got enough time, the up or out policy forces them to be promoted or get out. It's, you know, in the German army, you can be a company commander for your entire career. You can, you know, they will allow you to stay in those ranks. So really what we've got is we, we, we have a really weak place in the the company, which is the, the, the uh, most... I, 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 look, I, I understand what you're saying, but I mean, to go back to your original point, what we have is... 
a huge population and a big base where you have people who are under stress. And look, any police officer who had any training will tell you somebody who is suicidal is also homicidal. By definition, suicide is a homicide. So if you're dealing with somebody who is suicidal, you have a person who is least have a, has a better chance than the average person of committing murder on somebody else. And you're right. These are basically mass suicides or, or suicide, a murder-suicide event. If that's, uh, look, it's tragic. It's horrible. I, I hate the idea of suicide. But if that's where they want to go, and if that's going to be the end game, then I would say let's accelerate that to the end game and cut out some of the middlemen, which in this case would be other people that they're shooting, that they're killing. We simply have to have more first responders. I'm a first responder. You're a first responder. Your wife's a first responder. Anybody who has any kind of firearms training and can carry a gun is, in fact, a first responder. There's no need to wait to make a call for other people to show up while people are being shot. That is unconscionable. The XDM 3.8 Compact from Springfield Armory is two guns in one. Use as your concealed carry gun with a compact magazine and use the extended magazine for home defense. Carry 13 rounds of 9mm in the compact magazine and a whopping 19 rounds in the extended magazine. To see the entire family of Springfield Armory XDM pistols, go to SpringfieldArmory.com. That's SpringfieldArmory.com. Brownells proudly celebrates 75 years of history and heritage as the world's first choice for firearms, accessories, ammunition, and gunsmithing tools. So whether you're a gunsmith in need of parts and supplies, a new shooter looking for the perfect holster, or a skilled competitor seeking the latest gear, Brownells has what you need. And best of all, every purchase comes with the industry's only forever satisfaction guarantee. Visit us at brownells.com. Home invasions happen any time, day or night. Do you have a firearm close by? You can. And still keep it secure with one of the great wall safes from Console Vault. Plate steel construction, two levels of security, and models which hide in plain sight. Install two or three around the house. Always nearby, but secure. Lock, but quick to open. Visit ConsoleVault.com. That's C-O-N-S-O-L-E Vault.com. Ever thought about building your own AR-15? Well, what about building your own AR-15 lower receiver? We're HLF Manufacturing, and we make 80% lowers. Build your rifle the way you want it. Use the parts you want. Have it all shipped to your home. We also have uppers, parts, and other things you need. We even have complete build kits to make it really easy. Visit HLFMFG.com for the whole story. In the field or on the range, you need a trigger you can trust. For over 60 years, Timney triggers have been trusted by hunters and shooters everywhere. A Timney trigger could mean the difference between a great shot and a miss. Timney triggers are proudly made in the USA and come with a lifetime warranty. To order, go to TimneyTriggers.com. That's T-I-M-N-E-Y Triggers.com. Talk encourages you to support the local sporting goods store, gun stores, ATV dealers, and other local businesses in your area who advertise on this station and Gun Talk. Only together can we protect our rights. You're listening to Tom Gresham's Gun Talk. All right, back with the 866 Talk Gun, talking about the Fort Hood shooting. Uh, a lot of different ways to look at this. But I, I tell you, I, I simply come down to this with no exceptions I can come up with there's no place where we should have a gun free zone none none whatsoever I can't come up with one not schools not courtrooms not courthouses I can't come up with one halls of congress nah nowhere can't find any justification for it Hospitals? You got to be kidding me. Is there 
Are there places that you want to go where you say, I would really like to be unable to protect myself here? Yeah, I get up in the morning and say, yeah, I want to go search out some places where I can go, and I am defenseless in these places. I don't think so. Line one, Shelly's with us out of Seattle, Washington. Hello, Shelly. Hi. I didn't know if you had heard of this point or not, but it, this was in regards to about the same time that the Fort Hood thing happened in Detroit mm-hmm. where the man accidentally hit the little boy as he ran out into mm-hmm. the street. Um, no. he, he ran over him and or hit him, and um, he got out to help, and when he did, he didn't even make it to the boy because a um, about a dozen men ran out and started beating him, severely beating him. And the only reason why they stopped was because a retired nurse ran over and put herself between them and the man and and told them to get away and that she, she had a gun and she was prepared to use it. And so wow. I, I figured the only reason why she was even willing to get in there, because there was a crowd that gathered and watched as the man was being critically beaten, and they didn't, they didn't do anything, but she did, and probably she wouldn't have either had she not had the gun, and they probably wouldn't have backed off, and maybe she'd have been killed if she hadn't had a gun. Wow. Had not heard that story, Shelly, but thank you. That's, uh, wow, what a story. That's, that's amazing. It does bring up uh, another, and thank you for that call. Uh, in the state of Florida, let me a quick warning to the people there. Uh, a bill has passed the Senate, heads to the governor's desk. It's being called a warning shot bill. Beware, beware, danger, Will Robinson. It is not a warning shot bill. It does not make it legal to fire a warning shot. Warning shots are stupid. Stupid, stupid, stupid. Dangerous, don't do it. Most places, they're illegal. They'll still be illegal in Florida. Warning shots are a bad idea. They come straight out of Hollywood and TV. Forget it. Don't ever even think about firing a warning shot. If you are justified in using deadly force, then do what you got to do. But a warning shot is not it. But what this bill is, it basically it goes back to this call from Shelley. People in Florida have been charged with and sentenced under their 1020 life law, which is a dumb law, and I'll get to that in a second, for brandishing a gun or even threatening that, hey, I have a gun, back off, like this nurse did, gets charged with a crime and then get charged with using a firearm in a crime that invokes a mandatory sentence. This would remove that. You could, if you were justified in using deadly force or thought you were, then you could say, hey, back off, I've got a gun. Or you could pull your gun out and not shoot it, and that wouldn't be considered brandishing. You wouldn't be charged with that. Which brings me to this. Gun rights people, gun owner organizations, have erred over the years in pushing the uh, idea that, well, there should be additional penalties for the use of a gun in a crime. Stupid bad, it's being used against us. A crime is a crime. I don't care what kind of tool is being used. And when we agree to any kind of extra penalty for using a gun in a crime, what we're saying is the mere presence of a gun makes things worse. The fact that the criminal used a gun should get him or her extra penalties. And now what happens? They say, aha, You brandished your gun. So brandishing is a crime and using a gun is a crime. And that invokes the mandatory sentence. You didn't shoot anybody. You didn't hurt anybody. All you did was say, back off. I've got a gun. Bang. Ten years in jail. Huh. That didn't work out like we figured, huh? Always a bad idea. Don't agree to anything that says that using a gun in a crime is worse. It's not. Whether it's a baseball bat or a knife or whatever it happens to be. I appreciate Shelly bringing that forth because, yeah, this nurse could actually be charged with brandishing just by threatening the use of a gun. Hey, in about uh, 10 minutes, we're going to talk about the 20th anniversary of the Brady Bill and what an abject failure it has been. You don't have to agree with Tom to participate in the show. Call now with any of your concerns about guns, gun rights, or particular firearms, or suggestions for your shooting activity or personal protection. 1-866-825-5486. Gun Talk is coming right back.
All right, just a few minutes we'll be talking about the 20th anniversary of the Brady Bill became the Brady Law. That was what gave us the background checks. It's being proclaimed by the gun banners as a fabulous, fabulous, wonderfully successful bill. The only thing wrong with it is it didn't go far enough. We have to finish the job, they say. Funny how the gun banners always say that their gun regulations never go far enough. Well, we know it didn't actually work. But that's only because we didn't ban everything and go door to door and kick in your doors and drag you into the streets and throw you into the cattle cars and rush you off to the camps. Oh, (gasps) did we say that out loud? Oh, darn. You're not supposed to say that. Brad's on line four out of Elko, Nevada. Hello, Brad. Hey, Tom. Hey, a couple questions for you. Um, You know, the the micro-compact pistols and revolvers have become uh, enormously popular here recently. And I'm, I'm just wondering... What kind of what's the best kind of ammo to put through those? Or is, is there is typical hollow point performance going to be uh, diminished by the short barrels, or are we looking for higher velocity plus P type load? What's going on with that? The other thing yeah. was uh, okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, say so yes and yes are the answer to those questions. Um, uh, in fact, even as we speak, in my pocket at this moment is a Ruger LCP loaded up with uh, double tap ammo. There are three hundred three eighty. Uh, ACP 80 grain Barnes uh, TAC XP bullets designed specifically for short barrel guns like the uh, kel the Ace, uh, the Ruger. Uh, let me see, getting about 1,100, believe this or not, 1,100 feet per second, about 1050 out of the kel and about 1,100 out of the Burst of Thunder. Uh, so that's what I carry, and that, that's, that's what I would recommend. Well, does that make, does that make the recoil any stiffer? Sure, of course. You want more yeah. power, you get more power. Sure, sure. Uh, makes perfect sense. The other thing was, speaking of 380s, I just picked up the new Glock 42. Uh, yeah, what do you think? I'm really disappointed, actually. Um, this one, I, I, the first day out with it, I, I bought it. I took it straight from the from the store to the range. Mm-hmm. I put a box of uh, PMC ball through it. Mm-hmm. And suffered now out of out of the fifty rounds, there was probably I don't know a good half dozen malfunctions, whether it be stove pipes or failure, fail to okay. feed. I'm I'm going to tell you feed. what I think's happening. Okay, I'm going to tell you how to fix that gun. Fi- uh, you, you fix that gun by fixing the shooter. My guess is the gun works perfectly fine. My guess is that you're not gripping it tight enough and you're not leaning into it. Get your nose over your toes when you're shooting. Get your weight forward. Get your arms locked out. Grab that thing like it is going to get away from you. If it does, it will carry your life with you. You have to grab it like it's your life depends on it. I mean, in other words, squ- squeeze the ever-loving dickens out of it and shoot it again. I'll bet you a dollar to a donut you can fire 50 rounds through that gun without a single malfunction if you just grab it like your life depends on it. I, I just bet you that's what it is. Let me get to Mike real fast on line one, Anchorage, Alaska. Mike, don't have much time. Let's talk about a survival gun for your airplane. What are you looking for? Well, uh, I just wanted to get your thoughts on it. Um, you know, there's kind of a, a wide range of, of um, uses that um, one could expect from a a rifle in an airplane uh, from survive, using it to uh, collect small game uh, to defending ins- yourself from a bear. So I wanted to get... Uh, okay. Uh, here, here's my, here's, here's my take on it, because, you know, I fly a lot. Um, I would say a twenty two or a four ten shotgun is the way to go. Forget bears. You're not going to need bear protection. Uh, if you need anything at all, it's... You would, you know what? Honestly, you'd be a whole lot better off worrying about making sure that you have a personal locator beacon, a PLB, uh, a signal mirror, a uh, shelter, a tarp, uh, mosquito protection in the summer in Alaska, and a good sleeping bag in the winter. But by all means, a personal locator beacon, a PLB, in your pocket, not in the plane, not in the glove compartment, not in the back, in your pocket. If it's not in your pocket... It's camping gear. Only the stuff you have physically on you is actually survival gear. That's all you're going to have when it goes down. No black helicopters here. Just the facts about gun rights and gun ownership. This is Gun Talk.